brought together together out of Israel chosen men, about 30,000 in all. He and all his men set out from Bala of Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim that are on the ark. They set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which it was on a hill. Huzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the ark of God on it, and Ahio was walking in front of it. David and the whole house of Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord, with songs and with harps, with lyres, with tambourines, sistrums, and cymbals. Now King David was told, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed and Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went down and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fatted calf. David, wearing a linen ephod, danced before the Lord with all his might, while he and the entire house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sounds of the trumpets. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in a place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. After he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. Then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, a cake of raisins to each person in the whole crowd of Israelites, both men and women, and all the people went to their homes. When David returned home to bless his household, Michal, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, disrobing in the sight of the slave girls of his servants, as any vulgar fellow would. David said to Michal, It was the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone else from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. This is a passage that probably isn't all that familiar to most of us. But for the people of Israel, this is an important story. It's the story of the ark as it moves from this house of a high priest where it had resided for close to 20 years to be moved to, to Jerusalem, which would now be the, the center, if you will, for the people of Israel. Now, David's motives, we could probably sit there and scratch our heads for a moment and think, is it really about taking and bringing this Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, the capital, if you will, that will be for the people of Israel? Or is there a little bit of self-motivation that he had heard about all of the blessings that had come to this high priest's house, and maybe David wanted a few of those blessings for himself? The Ark of the Covenant held those Ten Commandments. And for the people of Israel, it was the presence of God right there with them. And so as they wandered the wilderness, the Ark went before them to, to guide them and along their journey. When they went into battle, it was that Ark of the Covenant that went before them. And again, it gave them the strength of knowing God is there with them. The presence of God was right there in their very midst. And so it is that we begin to wonder about this idea of the presence of God. It resided in a tent or a tabernacle as a journey along, and David had now made a special tent for it there in Jerusalem. 
Later we know that Solomon, as he builds the temple, will create that holy of holies where the Ark of the Covenant will reside. It is there that the people would think and, and, and relate to the fact that God's presence is right there in that very, very place. So my question to start with this morning is, where are those holy places where you know the presence of God in your life? Where is that place or places that you set aside and say, this is surely the place where God is present in your life? Some may think it's this very room, that this is a holy, sacred space, that surely God is present here with us. Maybe it's the chapel right through the door there. Maybe it's some other space, location that you can think of, that somehow that's a special place. That's surely where, where you can feel God's presence when you're there. But do you consider the true place where God resides? That holy temple that's been created for God's presence, and it resides within each and every one of us, in our heart and in our soul. That it's there that, that God is present in our lives. We are omni people by our faith, are we not? We believe in the omnipresence of God, that God is present everywhere and at all times. And that presence is within our hearts and within our soul. Think about it for a minute. As David is, is taking and, and moving this presence of God in the ark, he's rejoicing and giving thanks. But later God says, you know what, I need to truly be present with the people. And he comes in his son Jesus Christ to take and walk and be with each and every one to teach them and guide them and give them an example of how it is that they should live with one another. And what does Jesus do? When his days begin to grow short, and he knows that he will be leaving the presence of his followers, of those that are around him, he says, I'm going to send someone else to dwell within you, to be present with you. It's going to be the Holy Spirit. And it's there to be with each and every one of you. It was true then. It's true even today. That presence of God and the Holy Spirit is there within each and every one of us. Now comes the question of what do we do when we're in and, and accept the presence of God? Are we going to be like Macaw or are we going to be more like David? What does David do? David is dancing and rejoicing. There's music playing. It is a time of celebration. God is on the move. And we are here to worship. And we are here to give praise to God. And how do they do it? With joy. And too often we come and celebrate God's presence following the tradition that's about 600 years old. Go back 600 years when you find yourself in the 1500s. 1500s is the midst of the Middle Ages, the time of uh, monasteries and monks, and, and, and the idea that if you are truly religious people, you come into the presence of God in silence, quiet, it's meditative, soul-searching. You dress in drab colors, usually a black or a brown. You come with your head down, your hands folded. You come into the presence of God and just take and allow that presence to seep into you. That works. And I think there's a place for it. I think there is a time when we do need to be quiet before God. We need to take and allow God to speak to us. We need to be quiet enough to hear God's voice. 
But I also absolutely believe that when we come together to worship God, it should be uplifting. There should be a sense of joy. It should be a sense of taking and giving praise to God. It shouldn't be holding anything back. Because otherwise, we allow the McCalls of the world to take and begin to rule how it is that we live our lives, how we worship God. It's the McCall who, who, whatever reason she may have had, took and spoke to David with the stain of how, how can you be out there, the king of Israel, dancing and carrying on and singing and, and doing such a thing. After all, you're the king. How can you do that? David very simply said it because I want to celebrate the presence of God. And shouldn't that be where we find ourselves even today? That we should allow the celebration to take place. We shouldn't hold back our faith. We shouldn't hold back our joy. In fact, we need to let it out. That's one of the blessings, by the way, of vacation Bible school. If you were part of Vacation Bible School, one of the neatest things is just seeing five pews here in the front filled with kids and just allowing their spirit to just take off. To take and let them sing, let them take and shout, and it doesn't really matter because it's all in praise and worship of God. But somehow we, we talk that out of our kids, as I shared this morning. It's a church. You know, sit still. You know, be quiet. Why? We should allow the Spirit of God to move us. How many people have been to a Pentecostal kind of church? Those people know how to worship in the presence of God. The, there's that Methodist thing has been kind of shaken out of them. They, they take and allow the Spirit to come. They sing their hymns with joy. They take and see those, you know, sing and make a new song, shout for joy. You know, we sit there and let us shout for joy. Let us sing joyful, joyful, we adore you. Instead of singing with enthusiasm, we are here to worship God. We are here to give God the joy that God has blessed us. That's what David, I think, to some extent was seeking. He wanted to take and know those blessings, and he wanted those blessings for the people of Israel. He wanted it to take and have people understand God is with us, and for that we need to celebrate. We need to be people of joy. At times that's hard. At times, it's really hard to be people of joy when you find yourself in the midst of a storm. Whatever that storm may be, maybe it's finances, maybe it's relationships, maybe it's your health, maybe it's health of a loved one. And in the midst of all of that, we begin to concentrate on our woes. But the challenge is, is even in those moments when the storm is raging, when it seems like there is nothing that we can be joyful about, God is still with us. He goes before us. Even as we wander our own wilderness, God is with us. And that is reason enough to be joy-filled. Now, mind you, I'm not talking about being happy. Happiness is not the same as joy. Um, there are moments when I'm very unhappy, but I can still look and be filled with joy. Because I'm not alone. I have people around me who love and care for me. I have a God who is present in my life that I can take and gather His strength and that spirit, of the strength of the Spirit to help me get through knowing that there are rainbows ahead, the sun will shine tomorrow, that, you know, we'll get through this together. No matter where you find yourself this morning, if you're in the midst of a storm, look to know the presence of God is there and allow yourself to give joy and thanksgiving that God is present with you. You don't have to be any place special to be with God.
God goes with us as we walk out these doors. God is with us as we sit at our desks or go to our jobs tomorrow. God is with us as we make our dinners in our kitchens, as we go along the road in our cars. And it should be a time of celebrating, dancing, and singing, however you may do that. I don't do either one of those things really well, but I can allow my own spirit to dance and sing and give praise to God that he has come to be present with me in his son, Jesus Christ. And that presence remains as the spirit remains in me and remains in you. So worship God, not with this heaviness of, you know, you have to be quiet and respectful of God, but allow joy to come to us and give worship and praise to God. You find you feel a little bit better. Now we're going to take and see how well you've heard me this morning. I changed the hymn, okay? Because some of you don't like those repeating video hymns, you know? So I, I said, forget, we're going to do a different hymn. We're going to sing Joy to the World. You know, the other joy of the world. Now, I know it's the middle of August, but if you listen to the words that are there, it's not just a Christmas Advent kind of hymn. It's about taking and letting um, nature and, and, and sing to allow our souls to rejoice and sing in all that God has done for us in His Son, Jesus Christ. So, as you're able, let's get up, stand up. And let's sing with some enthusiasm. Enjoy the world. 